web applications. Uh, but the name just uh, uh, leads me towards making all sorts of silly puns. So this is a shiny workshop. So by the end of it, you should be able to create your own shiny dashboard, hopefully. Uh, so we'll be looking at uh, various interactive documents, interactive dashboards. Uh, I was looking around to see if there are any good examples out there. And I came across the data gov UK website, which has quite a nice dashboard looking at COVID data. Uh, and you look at it, it looks uh, like a fairly nice document showing, uh, say, people are tested positive uh, in England, etc. By the way, this workshop is largely inspired by me having COVID last week. So I was checking all the statistics, of course. And what you can do in an interactive document like this or interactive web document is so you can click on things and you can interact with it. You can look at various aspects of the data sets. For example, I looked at the numbers of infections uh, it's showing them from uh, beginning of 2020 until now. Uh, you can switch between linear scale and logarithmic scale. It will change the graph interactively. Uh, you can look at uh, just a period of time, let's say one month, and it changes. Uh, uh, it does change the visualization based on how you interact with it. And you can also zoom in uh, onto a section of the data. So it's really nice to just explore the data because a data like this uh, has multiple different ways uh, to look at it, multiple different aspects to investigate. And you can also have like, models uh, that then you can tweak parameters. Uh, and I think doing an interactive dashboard or interactive visualization is a really nice way to show everyone uh, and to allow everyone to explore it for themselves, uh, to really have a bit more deeper experience of uh, interacting with the data. Uh, so I was playing with this a little, and the nice thing here is you can actually download the data. So we'll be actually working with this data later on and trying to re-implement some of this dashboard. And uh, where I have my slides. Here, this is my slide. Uh, so I think this is a really nice example of an interactive dashboard. The, the great thing you can do with Shiny, if you have any kind of analysis in R that you did, let's say for a paper, you can create an interactive dashboard directly out of that uh, and then deploy it uh, for free. Uh, through shiny apps and then you can make it into like an accompanying website for your paper where people can interact with models interact with data so i think it's a really powerful tool uh, and as i said shiny is a library or framework that lets you turn your r code into an interactive website uh, you can even embed that into an R markdown document uh, and create an interactive document. Uh, I don't want to go too much into it, but you can, I think in, it's in testing right now, but you will be able to use Python with Shiny as well fairly soon. Or if you are more of a Python user, you can use other tools like Dash, which is very in, similar to Shiny itself. So enough of the background. I think it's uh, better to just play with the things uh, that you are trying to learn. So Shiny app in itself is basically three major components. One is called the user interface, which is literally what the user sees in the document. The second part is the server, which contains the background logic. And then you basically just bound them together in a shiny app function that takes the UI and the server. 
and that creates a system of communication between the user interface and the server. Uh, let's stop talking. I will try to show you a demo. So hopefully you should be seeing uh, VS Code. Uh, you can do exactly the same thing in uh, our studio. I just wanted to use VS Code because that allows me to just look at only the code and not have the whole R Studio uh, experience around it. I will show you how it looks in R Studio after a simple demo that I'll do first. So this is what I was talking about, uh, where I said that the Shiny app has three components. So first one is UI, which is the user interface, and the second one is the server, and then we put them together into a Shiny app thing. So when you are programming, the first thing you usually do is hello world. So let's try to create a hello world in Shiny. So what the UI is, uh, I'm calling a function called fluid page, which uh, creates sort of a uh, one type of website. Uh, we can ignore it for now, but into it, I can put various panels. So I will put in something called the title panel and put in hello world. And now let's run it. I can run it using run app. We'll get into this a bit later properly. Uh, and this is our website. Let's have a look how it looks in a web browser. So this is now in my Firefox. I'll try to have it side by side with my code. So now this is a website that says hello world, and this is my code. And if I edit it, save it, and reload the website, it changes automatically. So we have the first element, we can put in a headline. Doesn't look that shiny yet, so let's add, let in, let's add in something a bit more substantial. Uh, I would like to put in a plot because what uh, would be a dashboard without proper plot? I'll put in another panel. This will be a main panel, which will contain a list of things that I want to be displayed in the website. So let's put in, uh, into it, you can put various types of outputs. So let's put in a plot output. And let's give it a name, my plot. So. Let's see how it looks on the website. Now there is nothing because I don't have any plot yet because I need to put the plot into the server. The server is basically a container for functions that I can put into uh, the UI. Uh, I will type something and explain it later. So I will create something called output and put in a variable called plot, put it inside a function called render plot. And here I will be able to put in any kind of R code. Let's say I will do a plot. So let's say we'll create 100 plots. And why, let's say we take a random number sample from normal distribution. So this takes uh, a random sample from normal distribution with zero, vari zero mean uh, unit variance and it takes uh, n number of samples. So in this case, it's 100. Let's put it into a data frame. Just so that uh, our ggplot looks a bit nicer. 
And let's create a very basic ggplot. But points. In red color. So let's see what it created on the front uh, front end and on the website now we have a plot. Yay. So what I did in the code is I uh, uh, here you can see that into the front end I uh, added a plot output uh, with my plot as a name. So in the server, I created my plot as a variable within the output, uh, because that will be an output that will be sent to the user interface. And put it into something called render plot. The render plot uh, is a special function that deals with interactive plots later on. Uh, right now, it's uh, literally just taking the plot that we created and displaying it uh, in the UI. So this is not very impressive yet because now we just have a website that shows a single plot. Uh, let's try to make it interactive because you are here to learn about interactive dashboards. So let's um, add an that, ability. Yeah, sorry. Erin. Just before we move on, uh, I just want to double check that everything is clear for everyone. Um, Sorry for for butting in. Just no, that's all right. That's all right. Yes, yes, it's clear. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Awesome. So I will talk a bit about how it works underneath a bit later on. I just wanted to show you a code example because I think that's always the most helpful thing to see in the beginning. So let's add some interactivity. Uh, right now, here I hard coded the number of samples that I'm taking and displaying in my plot. But I want maybe the user to select the number of samples. So now let's put in something where we can put in some input. Oh. So here I want a number, so I'll put in a numeric input. Mm -mm. And the parameters are input ID. So let's say this will be N. Then I can put in a label, which is literally the description that will appear in the UI, and some default value. So the default value, I'd say 100. Reformat it so that you can see what's happening here. So what this will do is it will create a new element in the front end in the user interface that will allow me to specify n as the number of points. Uh, so let's see. Yeah, it says number of points. The default value is 100. I can change it, let's say 1000 and nothing will happen because I haven't added any interactivity into the server because I have and still hard coded here. So what I will do is I will change it to something called input dollar uh, n, which now accesses something that I'm getting from as an input from the UI with uh, n as an ID. I can change it, uh, uh, for example, to samples. And then here I would access it under input dollar samples. So now I can change the number of points and the plot will adapt. And of course, this is not a very nice uh, visualization of something like a normal distribution. So let's add another plot. This is now the ID of the plot. 
that I can use in the server to create something else that I want to show. And I will again use the render plot function uh, and give it some content. And let's say we don't want a point distribution, we want to look at a um, density estimate. So let's copy this and let's change uh, the geometry in the ggplot to density plot. And now if I reload the front end, it should, it's giving me an error because I messed something up. Uh, uh, let's have a look. Of course, I'm doing this on purpose because it's always useful to see how to debug a problem. So here it's giving me a bunch of stuff. Okay, my density plot requires um, different aesthetic settings. So this was a ggplot error. So if I refresh it now, it should show me a density plot, yay. So I hope from this, you can see the workflow, how it looks like. You create something in the UI, uh, which is how it will be uh, displayed to the user. Uh, and you assign it some ID, which can be anything. Uh, and then within the server, you have to create something with that ID as a variable into the output. And that will get passed uh, uh, to the UI internally. So I will also show you how it looks like in uh, RStudio. Hopefully you should be seeing my RStudio right now. It's exactly the same file that I was editing uh, before in VS Code. But in RStudio, I can run everything uh, just here in the top right corner of my code window, I have the run app arrow, which automatically detected that I am creating a shiny application. And if I press it, it will build everything and run it automatically internally. And you get the same output and the same interactivity. So how it works in the background. is that the server and the user interface are basically two basic items within a web application where the server typically runs not on your machine, but it runs somewhere, let's say in the cloud or on a machine somewhere. Uh, and user interface is what you see in the web browser. And they are passing uh, between themselves inputs and outputs. An input can be, uh, in the app I was showing, it was the number of samples. Uh, it can be any kind of user interaction. Hopefully during the workshop, uh, we will get to even a mouse interaction where you select something in the plot using a mouse uh, that will get passed as an input to the server. Server can do whatever it wants within, uh, sort of within our code and then passes the output to the user interface where it's displayed. So the, the most important item is that uh, variables within the input or output uh, variables, uh, sorry, I, uh, I don't remember the correct name in R, but uh, the thing you access through the dollar sign uh, within input and within output correspond to just string IDs in the user interface. So that's the only thing to keep an eye on that you have to call things the same name so that the 
user interface can identify and ask the server for the correct item. So I prepared a couple of interactive tasks for you. Uh, what I will want you to do is go to a GitHub link. I will put the link into the chat. And within GitHub, do please download the code. You can uh, click on the green button that says code and download it as an entire zip file. Unzip it on your machine. And then uh, you will see a folder called tasks. And we'll start with part one in tasks, where in app.r you will see basically the same thing that I live coded right now. And there are comments that say, uh, comments saying task one, task two, etc. So please read the comments, go through them in order. The first task is really to, first of all, get Shiny working on your machine and then just explore the structure of the app and try to add a new plot uh, that will be showing a different visualization of the data. Uh, and another thing I wanted to mention is there is a readme file uh, that shows you some instructions like how to install Shiny and what to go through in each of the tasks. So I think that this part shouldn't take too long. Uh, you'll be essentially creating uh, another plot that will be uh, shown in the front end. So I was, uh, I will stop sharing for a bit. So any questions right now before we uh, start working? If there are no questions, then I would suggest we split into breakout rooms. I think so I just wanted to go through the task uh, just so that everyone is on the same page. So you were asked to cr create a new plot in the user interface. So let's use the previous ones as a template. So I will create another plot output and it will be task one plot. Uh, one thing that I always forget about is that the, the panels in the front page uh, need a list of items that are contained within. So I need to put commas in between them. So I always forget to add a comma. So now I created a plot output with this ID. And now the task two was to create a plot on the server. So let's put in output, dollar sign, and the ID that I used. This will be a render plot, some code inside, and I will just copy this and adapt it. To use a different geometry for the ggplot, I don't want a density plot, I want a histogram. And I think I need to change this to look a bit nicer. So I think this should still be running, so I can just refresh it. And it's not there because I'm running a different thing.
So now I'm a bit confused which screen you can see. Uh, uh, can you see the web browser? Yeah, we can see the, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think it's the one currently we're seeing the task uh, shiny. I like the color. Uh, let me check. Oh, yeah. So now this is my histogram and I can change the number of samples and, and it should adapt. And you can see that the histogram is now ugly and I can more samples and the histogram is resembling a bit more of a normal distribution. So I hope that most people manage to run the Shiny app and create something resembling this. Uh, if not, don't worry, because if you look into not the tasks folder, but into the solutions folder, you should have the resulting script here that you can go through and uh, look through everything. So now uh, I wanted to look at the coronavirus dashboard and try to recreate part of it. So if you go to the code and look at uh, task two, there is now a data folder that contains a CSV file that I downloaded from the data.gov UK, uh, which looks like this. Uh, the relevant numbers here are, uh, this is area name is England, so it's for entirety of England. Uh, then here is a date. Uh, and the data that I downloaded are number of new admissions to hospitals, number of new cases by specimen day. That means the day that the sample was taken and new daily deaths uh, where death certificates mention COVID. So this is basically recreating uh, uh, this part of the dashboard where we have people tested positive in England, deaths with COVID on the death certificate and patients admitted to the hospital. So we'll try to recreate these plots and then interact with them a little. So if you go into the, the app.r in, in part two in tasks, Let's try to run this and see how it looks. Again, if you are using RStudio, you should be able to just click on run app. So this is how it looks like. So I created the first plot, which uh, looks at people who tested positive in England since the start of the pandemic. So this is how the plot looks like. And uh, your tasks, uh, again, highlighted in the comments, uh, are to put in the plots for the number of deaths and patients admitted in England. And then we will be adding some controls that allow us to choose the date range to display. Any questions before we go into uh, coding? Uh, if there are no questions, I just wanted to show you how it looks like right now. Uh, because the app.r is a normal R script, I can use standard R functions. Like here, I'm reading the data locally um, using read underscore CSV, which creates a table uh, data frame uh, containing all the data. And then the UI right now looks uh, like this. It's again, a fluid page with some title panel. These things, uh, this is 
horizontal ruler, which creates uh, um, just a line, just to visually uh, separate the output. And now here, the column is something that's uh, not familiar yet. Uh, it's basically a term from uh, website development where uh, in the framework that this is using underneath, it has 12 columns. And me creating three columns of width four means it will be split equally into three columns, each taking up one third of the, of the page. If I change the width, uh, it will take up a bit more of the, of the horizontal length of the website. Uh, and the nice thing is that it's uh, the it's a fluid uh, layout, meaning it's responsive. If you would look at it on a mobile phone, and the website would be smaller, it would you know, scatter underneath instead of taking up all the space horizontally. So that's quite a lot of terms. Uh, you don't have to worry about that unless you would like to tweak the layout. Uh, but what you can try to do is maybe change the width uh, of one of the elements. Let's say if I put in width equals two, it should make the element smaller. And you can see that the plot is now much, much smaller. So that's just uh, telling, uh, telling it how wide it should be. Don't worry about that. The important things are again, the outputs and inputs that we'll be putting in later on. Um, and here H3 means it's a third level of the heading. H1 is first level, H2 is the second level. And as previously, there are tasks. Start with task one. Uh, they are not in the top-down order. So after this, uh, look up task two uh, and continue with that. Yeah. There's a question in the chat about whether um, there's always 12 columns. Uh, yes, there's always 12 columns. If you are using Bootstrap, which is a uh, front end framework, uh, if you are familiar with the front end development, uh, it's a set of tools for your CSS files, which basically specify how it looks like. So in this framework, there are always 12 columns. All right, I will stop sharing my screen. So is everything clear right now? If yes, uh, I would suggest we split into breakout rooms again. This is how it should look like for you. Uh, so I'll just rearrange my windows so that I can see everything. Okay, so the first uh, couple of tasks were about adding uh, plots to show all the other indicators. So the first one is add a plot that will show the number of deaths with COVID-19 on death certificate. Use the tested positive plot as a template. Okay, so let's use this and let's just change the ID to uh, plot that will show the deaths. So this is all that was required in task one, just creating a plot output with a some specific uh, ID. Uh, uh, then task two, let's scroll down all the way into server uh, because we are creating a plot in the UI, but we don't see anything right now. Uh, that will actually create the plot in the server. So I will again use this as a template because I essentially want exactly the same plot. Let's call this. 
Now I call this the what? So what I'm doing here is uh, I'm creating a variable that corresponds to the ID that I created in the UI. So this is now taking the COVID data, passing it into a ggplot, and this is uh, looking at the number of people diagnosed. This is not the indicator I want to be showing. I want uh, the other one from the COVID data uh, data frame. So let's just check how it's called. Uh, uh, and it's this horrible name. So let's just put it in here. And change the title. So if I run it, it should uh, it should hopefully work. Hey, I, I have two plots. So let's repeat the same thing for the third plot as well. It's again the same thing, essentially. First uh, task two is finished. I'll just delete it so that it's not uh, adding to the clutter. So task three add a plot that will show the number of patients admitted to hospital, which will be again, basically the same thing. Plot output with an ID uh, and Let's call this admission. And I have to create the same thing on the server. Now I'm in server. Task four. And I need to be careful to use the same ID here. Plot. Again, using the same function. And this will be new admissions. Let's check that everything works. And okay, something went wrong because it's not compiling. Let's check the error. Come on. Oh, this looks fine. Let's just restart it. Ah. Oh, I have a typo. It's output, not output. Now we have three plots showing people who tested positive, uh, number of deaths and patients admitted to hospitals. Uh, so this is not very interactive. This is just a nice way to visualize our results. Uh, so I will walk you through the first part of the interactive interactivity that we'll be adding. And then I will let you work uh, a bit on the other parts. So we completed the first four tasks. So now we should be 
into task five. So let's add an option to choose the start and end date for the plots. For this, we will have to use a new element uh, from the uh, that we can add into the UI, which is called uh, date input. Uh, so let's create the first one for the start date. Uh, and the first element in the function is the ID that we'll be using to access it. Let's call it start date. This is a description that will appear. Default value will be, let's say here, I have the 1st of September. So let's see how it looks like uh, in the front end. And here I have a new element. And if I click on it, it will show me a calendar where I can pick a different date. I can choose, let's say, the 1st of January. It doesn't show, it doesn't do anything right now because it's only in the UI. We don't connect to it uh, through the server yet. But I can now select the start date. So let's do the same thing for the end date. I'll just copy it, change the ID. And let's make this 1st of March, 2023. The data don't go that far, so I hope that will work. And let's check it. And we have two calendar items here that we can interact with. And the, in the same way that we interacted with the plots, uh, we can do exactly the same thing with the dates. Uh, here we had to specify some ID, which will correspond to a variable that we'll use on the server. So task, six is now we have the start date and the end date for the visualization and we will filter our data based on those so here i'm using the covid data and i'm passing it into a ggplot so what i will do here instead is i will filter it first and i want the date which is an, a column in the covid data data frame I want the date to be larger or equal than the start date. And I want the date to be lower or equal to the, pass it on into the ggplot. Don't be confused that here I have like a proper larger or equal, smaller or equal, because that's just uh, uh, what my fancy fonts are doing in my editor. So let's check if this works. Not working off because it's a different language and here I just need one. Well, it's working in multiple different languages and I didn't save it. Ah, I, I'm not accessing the data correctly. Uh, they are in the input variable in the same way that we were in my first demo accessing the number of samples through the input dollar ID. We need to add this here as well. It should be working now. Yay, so <laughs> now it's showing me just the data from the 1st of September until now. 
and hope I can change it. Let's have a look at the start of the pandemic. Let's have a look, Let's say 1st of February, 2020 until, uh, let's say December, 2020. And you can see how it looked like. This is the start of the pandemic in March and April, and this is the big wave in the autumn. Of course, now it's affecting just one of the plots. So let's add the same thing to all the other plots as well, so that we can lay with the data a bit more. And it's showing us more reasonable values. Okay, the second plot and the third plot. And now it, uh, it's showing me all the numbers just for the specified date range. So if we change any of the dates, it should affect all the plots. So now you can see that we already have quite a nice interactive thing that looks fairly professional because this displays a nice calendar. You don't have to type in any string that will specify the date. It allows you to select it with a mouse. So this was the first part that I was asking you to do in the tasks. I think right now we should be done with task six. And then task seven and eight are asking you to add uh, an option to log transform uh, the data. So I will let you play with it for a bit. You can see all the correct working stuff in the solutions folder as well, if you want to have a look at that. Uh, if you didn't get the plots uh, and the date range selection uh, as, as far as I got here, you can always just copy it over from the solutions or just skip that and just uh, look at the log scale now because that's completely separate from the rest. So maybe let's take five, 10 minutes uh, to have a look at the log scale transformation. Uh, that one is asking you to create a new type of input. That's the checkbox input, and then change the scale of the plots based on that. Uh, if, uh, yeah, are there any questions? So also I wanted to mention in the meantime, uh, there was a question about uh, what to do if you are using Python. So there are two options, either use Python Dash, which is something very similar uh, to Shiny, only implemented in Python, or uh, there is an initial version of Python support for Shiny. So you'll be able to write your code in Python in the same way that I'm doing it right now in R and have it displayed in the same way. So going back to our exercises, I think I left off uh, at uh, implementing a log scale, linear scale uh, transformation. So what I was asking here is to put in a checkbox that uh, will allow people to select if they want to see the data on log scale or on a normal scale. And you can see that all the inputs always have uh, something, something input in a name. So in the same way, a checkbox has checkbox input. And the first argument is again, the ID that I'll be using on the server as a variable name. So uh, let's call it log transform. Uh, this is again the display name or what will be displayed in the front end. Um, uh, 
and I can give it a default value. A default value is false. Let's check rid of this so that it's easier to see what's happening. Let's see how it looks like. And here I have a new checkbox that I can check. Again, it's not connected to anything on the server, so it's not doing anything right now, but it works as a checkbox. That's a success. Now task eight. Now we have the value of the checkbox. So how do we use that in the code now? Again, the value will be in input dollar because that's the name that I used when I created the checkbox as an ID. And it's a Boolean, meaning it's either true or false. So I can create an if statement. So if I want to transform, if it's true, then uh, uh, let's create a new variable. Transformation will be ten. Otherwise, eighty, because that's for the normal linear scale. And here I'm specifying the scale for the y variable. So I can just change identity here to what I have in my transformation variable. So again, what I'm doing here is I'm through the input dollar log transform accessing the value from the UI uh, that I had here from the checkbox. And if it's true, I am transforming the data logarithmically. If it's false, I am using the identity transformation, which is no transformation. Let's see how it looks like. So everything is normal. And now I'll check the log transform. And the data in the number of cases transformed. So it seems to be doing something correct. Let's look at the beginning of the pandemic again, because as everyone knows, infections grow uh, exponentially. So it should show up as a uh, linear line in the, uh, in the logarithmic plot. So again, Let's look at the first year. Mm -hmm. Let's maybe look at how it was growing throughout April. You can see that you can just interact with it quite nicely, interactively. And here you can see the first couple of infections in February, March, and then linear growth in the logarithmic plot until April translating to exponential growth uh, in the linear scale. And we can do the same thing for all the other plots again. In the same way, I'll just copy that over. Now it should translate into all the other parts as well. So if we look at, again, the beginning, say from March until the end of April, you can see it's in the linear transform and this is the logarithmic plot. 
So this was just another type of input. And I'm just conscious of the time, so I'll just show you the result. Uh, the rest of the tasks were looking at implementing a smoothing parameter, which gives us uh, a, uh, a slider where we can select how much do we want to smooth the data. Uh, because right now it's showing quite a lot of the week to week uh, difference. But if we look at the actual website, you can see that the data are smooth. So, so it obscures. Uh, the weekly pattern. So in the solutions, you can see how to add smoothing. And then it allows you to create a nice smooth plots uh, that are uh, glossing over the week to week variants. And I also had a third part uh, I will just show you. I don't want to go through the code. It's in the solutions folder uh, that shows how to implement mouse control, where you can select part of the plot and zoom in just on that. So here I selected part of the uh, tested positive plot. And for the range, it showed me what's the start date, what's the end date, how many observations are there, what was the minimum number of cases during that time period, and what was the maximum number of cases in the time period. So again, this is just another type of input. It's fairly easy to implement that. And you can see that it's this is actually really quite shiny because for a person who doesn't have any web development experience, to have an interactive plot where you can interact with things through mouse actions is actually really nice. And to, I'm sure you can impress your colleagues by doing that quite a lot. So I will stop sharing my screen. You can go through any of the results or any of the code in the solutions folder. So hopefully that will be helpful. And as I mentioned, I'll be in the next collaboration cafe answering questions, talking through any, anything or going through the solutions again, if you're interested. Any questions? <laughs>